What are the ramifications when healthcare providers struggle with mental illness, and how do we support those providers in both their personal and professional lives? Let's talk all about it with physician author Kyle Jones right here in episode 265 of The Nurse Keith Show. Well, hello and welcome to The Nurse Keith Show. I love having you along for the ride, whether you're new to the show or you've been hanging out here on this journey with me for months or years. As always, thanks for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. This podcast is all about you and your nursing and healthcare career, and I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, medicine, entrepreneurship, and beyond. And did you know that Nurse Keith Coaching is your one-stop shop for all things related to your career? That's right. I offer individualized coaching for nurses and healthcare professionals around the world. And if you mention that you're a listener, you'll get 10% off your first coaching package. So email me today at keith at nursekeith.com and we'll schedule a complimentary consult to explore how coaching can help you have the most satisfying life and career possible. Meanwhile, if you want to see the show notes for this episode, which I highly recommend, you can follow along at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 265. And today we're welcoming friend of the pod, Kyle Bradford Jones. He is a physician from Salt Lake City, Utah, and we're talking about his new book, Fallible. And Kyle, let's jump right into it and then we'll talk more about your life and your bio and your career. But what is it about doctors, physicians, surgeons, nurses, and other healthcare providers where Depression and anxiety are such a huge part of our lives, professionally and personally. What is going on? You know, I've thought a lot about that and looked into it. And, you know, there's so much that goes into it. Really, when you consider the nature of medicine itself, where we are dealing with life and death, we are uh, expected in many ways both expectations we put on ourselves and that others put on us of not making any mistakes, of making sure we're doing it just right. But at the same time, we have relatively little control over a lot of what happens to the individual patient. And so, first of all, you have those things coming all together. But then when you go through training, whether it's medical school or nursing school and residency, everything just... Uh, kicks up and you have things such as uh, what we call in medical school and residency pimping where the attending physician is is just kind of pummeling you with questions with the idea of embarrassing you in front of everyone else to try to motivate you to uh, to study more and you have also this environment where you're not sleeping very well because you have these huge long shifts. I mean, it, it, it's kind of this constellation of things that bring it all together that really put us at higher risk. Higher risk is right. It puts the providers, nurse, doctor, PT, whatever, at higher risk of stress and stress related illness, or at least symptoms related to stress, right? Maybe not a full-blown illness. And then we have depression, sure. anxiety, secondary trauma. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? So absolutely, your new book is called Fallible, a memoir of a young physician's struggle with mental illness. And that right there, that is so incredibly transparent right there. And I've shared on this show that I struggle with depression, that I've been diagnosed with PTSD over the years. And so I'm familiar with this particular territory. And I think yep. a lot of people listening probably are if they work in healthcare yes. or maybe if they don't work in healthcare as well. So what is it do you think about medicine that contributed to your depression and anxiety. You just illuminated some of that in your first response, but is there something more that we need to explore here that you feel like is a contributing factor? I really feel that there were multiple things contributing to it. A lot of it that did come from medicine. Part of it was uh, my anxiety came on when I was uh, an undergraduate student and had was 
putting so much stress on myself to be the perfect student so I could get into medical school and do all of these things. And I had to get all A's in all of my classes. And I had to uh, try to shadow different physicians and work in healthcare and do research and, and study for the MCAT and all of these things. And so I ended up putting a lot of pressure on myself to do that. Um, but then it's interesting because when uh, students enter medical school, they have the same rates of mental illness as the general population. And by the time they leave, their rates of depression and anxiety are significantly higher and their risk of suicide is significantly higher. And there is some aspect, I believe, of not understanding exactly what you're getting into, so to speak. Um, there's a, a perspective that that we miss in there somewhere. And then those other things we mentioned with you know, lack of sleep, uh, a harsh work environment oftentimes. And so I, my depression really came on uh, when I was a resident uh, during my first year of residency. And, you know, it was the expectations, the lack of sleep, the uh, guilt of not spending time with my wife and kids, of, uh, you know, just being terrified of making a mistake and killing someone. All of these things made it so hard. And there were times where I really struggled just to function and just to get out of bed and go to work. And, you know, thankfully, I've gotten to a point now where I can function highly and be successful. But it's been really difficult to get there. Mm -hmm. I can relate. I can relate. It's been one of my lifelong paths as well, one of my journeys. So there's probably a listener out there thinking, well, did Kyle have any underlying depression or anxiety prior to going to school? And you're nodding yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. so yeah. looking back at childhood and some experiences in early adulthood, I think I definitely had some signs of being at high risk of developing anxiety and depression. And looking back at my family history, you know, I it's tough to get a good family history of mental illness because it's likely that uh, one of my grandmothers had severe depression, but nobody would talk about it. They didn't call it that. And so there's likely a genetic component, but mm -hmm. it's not entirely clear. Um, but absolutely uh, looking back and seeing some of the signs and some of the things uh, that I did or didn't do as a kid uh, really kind of uh, put it in perspective for me that, you know, I was somewhat set up for this to begin with. Yeah. And, you know, if we look back at the 20th century, it's really the second half, the latter half of the 20th century, when depression, anxiety, mental illness became a thing that we talked about, you know, with the, the advent of psychotherapy becoming, you know, more prominently available to your average person, let's say maybe in the 60s and 70s and definitely the 80s, that's where the rubber hit the road. And this started becoming like a national or international conversation. But the generations before us who grew up in the 20s and 30s and 40s back in the, in the 20th century, that wasn't a thing. Like people didn't talk about that. Sure. People were sent away to quote unquote asylums here and there, but it wasn't part of the popular culture and the conversation. You didn't have celebrities and doctors and nurses and sports people coming out saying, Hey, I struggle with depression or I have suicidal ideation. You know, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't talked about. Right. And I feel like even in the last 20 years or so, you, you see this huge uptick in that. Uh, there was a, a professional football player a month or two ago, uh, and I, I wish I remembered his mm -hmm. name, but he uh, struggled with anxiety for years and used to miss games because of it and ended up missing a game uh, this season because his anxiety was so bad. Mm -hmm. And he was completely open about it and said, yeah, this is – what I was dealing with and this is why I missed the game. And, you know, I feel bad that I had to uh, let my teammates down and not play, but I simply couldn't because this is the illness that I have. And just things like that go so far, you know, for so many of us with uh, the stigma against depression and anxiety and it being seen almost as a moral failure mm -hmm. in our culture. And so you have 
you know, to your point, a professional athlete, um, a celebrity, et cetera, coming out and saying, no, I struggle with this too. That is huge. I really think that goes a long way. It does. And it's not a character flaw, though we often see it as a character flaw and addiction too. We can often pin people with that and addiction is a disease. So, you know, there's interesting conversations happening in the wider culture right now in the 21st century. And here we are two decades into the century and the conversation still evolving. And so you're an associate professor in family and preventive medicine at the University of Utah School of Medicine. And you did your training at the Medical College of Wisconsin and a residency at the University of Utah. So do you feel there's risk involved in you being so public about this struggle? What are the liabilities for you here? You know, I've I've thought a lot about that and kind of looked into it before writing and publishing a book because obviously I don't want to lose my job or anything mm-hmm. like that. Um, but a lot of people, a lot of physicians and I think nurses and other healthcare professionals worry about losing their license, um, that you are uh, in some ways admitting that you may not be uh, in the right mind, state of mind to practice medicine. However, that is something that has never worried me simply because it's something that I've worked through. You know, I am uh, receiving treatment in terms of medication and therapy. I uh, am doing the things that uh, that I can, and there's not any sign at any point that I was significantly impaired in uh, uh, practicing medicine. And so a lot of uh, practitioners do have that worry, um, but it's not something that's ever really bothered me. And part of it, too is that I started writing about this uh, four or five years ago on some uh, medical blogs. And the immediate reaction that I received of so many doctors and residents saying, oh, you too? And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I didn't know there were others. Or, you know, it makes, it makes me feel so much better that I can be a little more open. Um, honestly, I feel like that outweighs any risks that I have in talking about it. Right. And there's there's this point at which we realized recently, because I've only recently seen the, the some of the statistics about depression and mental illness in healthcare providers. And what I've read recently is that, you know, an average of one physician commits suicide per day in the United States. That's just the United States. So that's an, they say about 400 a year. We don't have very good stats on nurses and nurse practitioners and other healthcare providers, but we can extrapolate that it's probably an issue. I would assume. Um, Absolutely. We just happen to have the stats on doctors. So what are the positive ramifications of you coming out like this or me talking about my struggles with depression? What are the positive ramifications for other people, either who are in the profession or outside the profession or thinking of coming in and thinking, oh, I couldn't do that because this is a real issue for me. So have you already seen any positive reflections back to you from your being transparent? Absolutely. So when I first heard about it, um, as I mentioned, four or five years ago, there was uh, a friend of mine who was uh, a colleague and he read it and came up to me shortly thereafter and said, you know, I, I've always felt this, but I've never really thought that I needed to do anything about it. Uh, but I'm realizing after reading your story, I've gotten to the point where I need some treatment Mm. and, Um, and so, you know, he started on medication, started seeing a therapist and it helped him out immensely, you know, just little things like that. I, I, as I mentioned, I, it's been so many physicians, um, and nurses uh, as well, where once they read that, they just seemed so relieved, like, okay, I'm not the only one who is struggling. So it really has to do with stigma, but also reaching out and getting the treatment that you need. Absolutely. And so your goal for this book then is to what? 
Mainly, to, first of all, to decrease the stigma that okay. uh, not only within medicine, but also in the general population, because there's still that stigma everywhere. And to be able to recognize that, hey, it's okay to struggle. It's okay to ask for help and to seek treatment if you need it. And uh, But then also with trying to break down that stigma, then encouraging people to get the treatment that they need so they can function as best they can. Mm, yeah. And I, I assume, based on what I've read in your book, that you said that rates of substance abuse are much higher among physicians than the general public. And yeah. you asked the question, whether it's rhetorical or not, does that result from the higher rates of mental illness or does it help cause it? And you wrote, it seems an easy answer to the stressors we face, the death, the injuries, the poor outcomes, the ever-present threat of malpractice, the not infrequent verbal and even physical abuse from patients, the long hours and decreased sleep. We accept this castigation as part of the deal of medicine, part of the calling, part of the pact. We also have easy and sustained access to abusable drugs, so it's a perfect storm that harms harms physicians and all of us as patients. So that perfect storm, it sounds like is what you're calling out here in your book. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a big part of it. I know you've talked a lot on the podcast about the healthcare system and the way it's set up. Mm -hmm. Um, and every system gets the results it's set up to get. And so like, <laughs> Even though this isn't the healthcare system anyone would choose, it's kind of evolved and grown into this behemoth that mm -hmm. none of us can really flourish in. Um, and that often means patients, um, and it certainly means healthcare providers. Uh, we just get, we're just a, a piece in the cog, and we're not able to to care for patients the way that we wanted to. And for a lot of us, the, the reason we got into this was those connections and caring for those patients. And now we can't do that. Mm -mm. No, I mean, I talk to nurse practitioners, for instance, who work in family medicine, maybe um, clinics for the underserved, federally qualified health clinics and physicians too, or PAs. And they are so hard pressed to see a patient every 15 minutes when those patients are highly complex. Um, they come in not just with, say, a virus or a suture removal. They also have psychosocial issues and family issues and mental illness and substance abuse. And, you know, you can't just say our 15 minutes is up. Please leave. We can't get into this now, even though I know your daughter just died. You know, it's like yeah. so you're always behind the eight ball. And whether it's in the hospital or a clinic or an outpatient surgical center, I mean, you're always running against the clock. And I feel like this whole idea of productivity and the way in which, well, of course, we need to make money in healthcare. You know, it's a business. Sure. But I feel like there's so much lost along the way. And obviously, from reading your book and from my knowledge as well, how much damage is being done to our providers and, you know, whether you leave the profession by attrition because you just can't take it anymore or you leave by other means, you know, sometimes by suicide, what are we doing to our clinicians and what are we doing to our healthcare system? What's the risk to us as a culture and a society here? Oh, I'm, I worry the risk is huge here mm -hmm. because when, uh, Roughly 50% uh, of physicians have some signs of burnout. That's increased 20% in three years. I mean, it's it's almost as if this is starting to take on an exponential growth in terms of, of physicians and providers struggling within the system. Um, and it just seems to be getting worse. Um, you know, just yesterday we met with um, – uh, a team about uh, some changes that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are are making for home health orders. And basically, my number one thing is, well, what do we need to do without adding anything for our providers to do? <laughs> and they're like, well, that's not what this change is. You have to right. do this and this and this above what you're doing. And you think, 
boy, when we, you know, you mentioned the 15 minute appointment and you're trying to deal with all of these things in that short time. But then, uh, uh, I know you've also cited a study that says we spend twice as much time on non-clinical aspects of the physician of the patient visit than we do actually seeing the patient, and so then documenting and struggling with insurance companies and all of these extra things. That, my goodness, I mean, we—it's almost as if the system is trying to drive providers out of it. It's just amazing, and obviously, the more. Uh, nurses and physicians end up leaving, that puts that much more pressure on those still there. Um, and it's it's kind of uh, perpetuating this, uh, this terrible environment for all of us to practice. Absolutely. And then if you're struggling with mental illness, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, whatever it happens to be, and you're a provider and things get keep, get piled on top of you, ad nauseum, so to speak, or maybe it would be ad infinitum. I'm not sure which, maybe both, (laughs) you know, what, what are you supposed to do? And what are the, what are the, um, survival skills to be able to, to make it through to the other side? And may I, may I be personal and ask how old you are? Yeah, I'm 38. So you're 38. So I've been in touch with some medical residents and medical students over these last few years who, you know, as part of the millennial generation or kind of on the cusp of the millennial generation, you're kind of a little older. I'm, I'm borderline. Of, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my son is 36. In, in all he's, the ways. <laughs> yeah. He's older millennial too, if even a millennial, but still this generation, I feel like is poised to make some changes because those of you now in your thirties are going to be the leaders in a decade or so or less. And the millennials are now the largest part of the workforce anyway. So I feel like there's a sea change happening. However, we need enough, what would you call it? Critical mass of providers to stand up and say, whoa, wait a second. And I'm hearing from these medical residents saying, we have to do this in a different way. We can't continue to punish our medical residents and our interns this it can't i mean of course you want it to be robust the educational system but if you're struggling with depression if you're struggling with suicidal ideation the last thing you need is like you use the word castigated in that paragraph i read you can't just keep getting beaten over the head with this stuff because yes it's going to drive us away and you know at least 33% or more of new nurses leave the profession within the first one to two years of entering the profession. And if we have 400 doctors in the United States committing suicide a year, if we have 30 to 50% of new nurses leaving the profession within two years of coming into the profession, that doesn't bode very well for the robustness of our system, does it? Yeah, and especially when... We're already facing shortages of, of nurses and physicians and PT, et cetera, et cetera. You know, mm-hmm. it's just making it worse. And it's so hard. And, you know, even the the 400 uh, physicians who commit suicide every year, that's probably a low number because there's still that stigma. A lot of causes of death uh, are not open of about uh, suicide. And, sure. you know, it, it's even a bigger problem than than what we can quantify. Very true. That's so true. So, Kyle, this is incredible conversation. We could talk for hours. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to dig deeper into your book and into what more you would like this book to accomplish. I would like you to read a passage from the book, and then we're going to talk just more about these struggles and potentially some solutions that we might have rattling around in our heads for how to turn this around. So just hang in there, and we will be right back for the second half of episode 265. So now we're going to take a pause for the cause for just a moment. 
please consider becoming a patron of The Nurse Keith Show, just like other awesome listeners who value the show so much that they want to give just a little bit each month to support the work we're doing here. When you pledge, you not only get the satisfaction of helping produce and support The Nurse Keith Show, you also get some pretty cool premiums and gifts from yours truly. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith to read all about it. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Nurse Keith. And if you know someone who could benefit from career coaching with me, please consider referring them. And if they become a paying client, you'll receive credit for an hour of coaching with me. And there's no expiration date on that credit, so you can keep it in your back pocket until you need it most. And remember that you can refer as many people as you like and continue to earn those coaching credits. What an incredible deal. And please head over to NurseKeith.com and sign up for my newsletter which comes out regularly and brings you supportive messages updates from my blog and my podcast resources and all sorts of other stuff remember nursekeith.com sign up for that newsletter and you'll also get a free download from me as my gift to you anyway those are my sincere asks today so now let's dig back into today's topic without further ado. So thanks for hanging out here on the Nurse Keith Show, episode 265. Remember, those all-important show notes are at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 265. We're with Kyle Bradford-Jones, a family physician and author up in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we're talking about his upcoming book, Fallible, a memoir of a young physician's struggle with mental illness, which will be out officially on April 2nd, 2020, but available for pre-order on Amazon prior to that, of course. So Kyle, before this, we were talking about the rate of physician suicide, the rate of nurse attrition. We don't have the rates for nurse suicide and depression, but we know it's very high. So do you have a passage from the book that you'd like to read to just kind of give a listener out there a peek into your brain and what this book is all about? Absolutely. Major League Baseball Hall of Fame umpire Bill Clem grew weary of all the insults he constantly heard. As he aged, he suffered from a skin condition on his hands that he was convinced resulted from the immense anxiety and tension he faced every day in his interactions with fans, players, and managers. Unlike many empires in the early days of professional baseball, he avoided overdrinking to assuage his anxiety. Most baseball fans, he once said, feel that these verbal and public humiliations go in one ear and out the other. Well, they don't. They go in one ear and go straight to the nervous system, eating away coordination, self-confidence, and self-respect. Not only were verbal attacks and humiliations a blow to my psyche, but they attacked how others interacted with me. Fellow students I considered friends began to distance themselves from me, despite the fact that they also received similar barrages from time to time. Some nurses were also keenly aware of which students received the harshest tongue lashings and often treated those students more harshly as well. A few nurses mocked me, and I regularly saw them rolling their eyes when I tried to talk to them about a patient. But worst of all, the berating often occurred in front of patients and their family members. It was uncomfortable for them, but also eroded their trust in me as I tried to care for them. Often, it even eroded their trust in the attending physician whose behavior they found dissatisfying. No wonder studies show a worsening of the public's trust in doctors over the last few decades. Doctors live in an antagonistic dichotomy. They need a thick skin but a soft heart a sharp mind amidst extreme fatigue, a compassionate soul with a firm demeanor, and complete selflessness at the expense of mental and physical health. The messages medical students get are harsh. Don't be weak. Dedicate yourself to the care of the patient at all costs. Don't question your attending. Ignore the fact that you don't get to eat or sleep. And remember that leaving the hospital is abandoning your patient. Don't do too little because you need to rule out all the scary diseases, but don't do more than that is necessary because over-testing and over-treating is also harmful to patients. 
see patients more quickly to maximize billing and revenue, but don't skimp on your time with them because they need to give us good satisfaction scores. Make sure you get good marks on your quality measures, but don't ignore all the other aspects of caring for your patient just to focus on those metrics. Follow this treatment protocol to a T, but personalize your care. Even the brightest and strongest don't stand up well to such contradictory expectations. So, Kyle, contradictory expectations. I mean, everything you read there is a contradiction. It was like, don't skimp on your time, but see your patient in 15 minutes. Don't do too little. Don't do too much. Make sure you're focused on revenue, but make sure you're focused on patient satisfaction, which also feeds into revenue. Um, the it, it, You used the term perfect storm earlier. It's a perfect storm. It's It's kind of like hitting you over the head and then saying you shouldn't have a headache because I just hit you over the head. I mean, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. And I know there's been changes to medical education. You know, there's been legislation passed, I think by Congress around how many hours you can work in a row without having a break or sleeping or something, right? That has been instituted, but I don't think it's really gone very far, has it? Or far enough anyway. No. No, it hasn't. When I was a resident, we had a limit of uh, 30 hours for our shift. And, you know, I don't know about everybody else, but I am not very sharp after 20 plus hours without sleeping and having to care for patients. And the last, you know, 10 hours of those shifts, Mm -hmm. I was terrified I was going to make a mistake because I knew I was not thinking clearly. And when you you know you mentioned the uh, other hour restrictions, uh, I don't believe they're uh, passed by Congress, but I think Congress threatened <laughs> to if oh if oh, uh, it was a threat. I see. I believe the ACGME uh, didn't do it themselves, and they've kind of gone back and forth a little bit. You know, they limited the total weekly amount to eighty hours, which you know a lot of people in different professions work eighty hours a week. Um, but the way those shifts are set up, like I said, with sometimes being a 30 hour shift, you know, that, that is not safe for us. It's not safe for patients. Um, it's the, when you are driving home after being awake for 30 hours, you, uh, your mind and, uh, reflexes are the equivalent of being drunk. And so you are essentially drunk driving, going home and, you know, all of these things are terrifying and it's hard because there are so many different uh, elements that go into it and and would be good to uh, to help adjust it. And there's no easy answers or easy ways to fix a lot of this. In a lot of countries in Europe, they have even stricter hour limitations, um, but they have a similar rate of mental illness and burnout among uh, resident and attending physicians. And so do they. And so it's interesting. You think, well, uh, of course you want more time. And if you have more time to sleep or to spend with your family or or whatever it is, um, but that uh, doesn't seem to be as big of a fix as you would think it would be for some reason. I think there's a lot more factors at play here than than just sleep or just the hours. I mean, it's it's a big package. And I want to read a paragraph from the book. I don't know what page or chapter it's from, but I highlighted sure. a ton of paragraphs here and put them in a Word doc. So it says, um, those in the medical profession spend so much time together, bear so many of the same burdens, experience the same increased incidence of mental illness together that we almost begin to look alike throughout medical school and residency. We share an insulated microcosm of suffering. The light goes out of our eyes. The outward resolve typically remains but doesn't match the inward emotion. It's almost like close female friends or roommates who have their periods at the same time each month somehow sinking their hormones in uterine shedding. We all bleed together. In such settings, mental illness and substance abuse spread like wildfire. So you're here, you're saying how I think with when women have their menses at the same time, they call it entrainment. I think that's the term. So in a way, this is happening with you during your medical school and residency. You're all being entrained to suffer in what you call an insulated microcosm of suffering. And that right there, I mean, that. 
that should give anybody pause who either wants to go into medicine or be treated by a medical provider. Yeah. Why do we need to suffer in order to become providers? Why is it seen as a necessary experience? You know, I, I wish I had a good answer for that. I'm not sure I know, aside okay. <laughs> from that's the way it's always been done. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's in many ways, that's kind of the the glamour of medicine when you look at it from the outside of yeah, you, you know, you're, you're totally selfless. You're caring for this patient. It's so wonderful. You're doing this, this great good. Um, and I, I think part of that thinking that kind of permeates into medical providers too of, okay, well, this must be what I'm supposed to be doing, uh, even though it's damaging you and in the end may be affecting your patients as well. But as far as I can tell, it seems to be mostly – uh, kind of a tradition thing. That's just how we do it. That's the way it's always been done. I think those are some of the most dangerous words in healthcare. Um, I've written a blog post about that and a, and a, done a podcast, the seven most dangerous words in healthcare. That's the way we've always done it. Whether it's how we insert a Foley cath and that's just the protocol we've always used, or this is the way we've always hazed our medical residents, right? Yeah. I was hazed that way. So that's the way it's going to be for these ones too, because now it's my turn to make them suffer. Or you have these older nurses who haze and bully new nurses because they were hazed and bullied. And it's like, well, it's my turn now, right? Yeah. So they have to suffer the way I suffered. And I don't, think it really needs to be this way but we are in the midst of a period of time here where we are we're striking back against this we're pushing back but there's still a lot of pushback to keep things the way they are so your book is obviously necessary because the way we've been pushing back hasn't worked yet yeah <laughs> basically and and you know to to your point of uh, nurses and physicians uh, hazing and and treating them how we were treated. It, I don't even think a lot of that is conscious. It's just that's that's what we know. Um, uh -huh. uh, that's this is how we treat people. And uh, but you also have the aspect of well, the ones training are under the same immense stress and uh, burnout and potentially mental illness. And so they have a diminished capacity to uh, to handle what's going on as well. And so, of course, they're going to be more irritable and more difficult to, to work with. Mm -hmm. That's right. And for a listener who wants to dive a little deeper back into the archives of the Nurse Keith Show, I want to point them to episode 216 with Dr. Ted O'Connell. He's a physician and professor of medicine out in California, and we talked a lot about medical residency and how he treats his residents differently. He brings them to his home, has them meet his family and his children, they come for dinner, and he says, look, you can actually have a life. Like, medicine doesn't have to kill you. You can actually have a happy life and find balance. So, and then um, episode 232 with my friend Dr. Erica Elliott here in Santa Fe, she talks about arriving at a Navajo clinic in Cuba, New Mexico, treating mostly Navajo folks, and being thrown into right out of medical school and residency, actually basically being an emergency room physician, not having been trained for emergency medicine. And she was thrown into it on her very, very first day with no other physician around to help her. And yeah. I mean, incredible stories of duress. And, you know, earlier in the first half of the show, you mentioned childhood events and childhood trauma and you were going back in your mind thinking back on your childhood like what happened and you even say in writing that your childhood was fairly benign and yeah and so my friend and colleague leslie peters was recently on episode 262 and she's a specialist in aces study it's the adverse childhood event study and she is an expert in picking apart and and elucidating what happens to us from adverse childhood events. So whether you're coming from a difficult life or 
you just hit the wall in medical school, it doesn't really matter in the end. Because yeah. if physicians, medical students going through school, manifest more mental illness than the general public, even though before medical school they were right on target with the rest of the general public, yeah. something is wrong. Like, There's something wrong in Denmark, you know what I mean? And, well, <laughs> yes. not to cast aspersions on Denmark, they probably have an awesome healthcare system there, <laughs> but just to quote Shakespeare, um, or yes. paraphrase Shakespeare... So, Kyle, you're 38, and I'm assuming you're going to be practicing medicine for another at least several decades, right? Yeah. yeah. Possibly. I plan on it. You plan on it at the moment, (laughs) and a lot of your colleagues, too. So what do you see as some potential solutions? Do you have some ideas for what we can change And let's focus right now on physicians and medical students. What can we do? Because this is an epidemic and physicians are super important in our culture and our society. And do you have some solid ideas or theories about what could happen? You know, as we've mentioned with so many different uh, causes to create this storm, there's so many different potential solutions. Um, And there are some examples out there of programs and schools that are trying to get more creative uh, in terms of how they train. So, for example, even though in my residency program, a lot of I still faced a lot of this uh, uh, cruel punishment and moral injury, Mm -hmm. um, the majority of my attendings were great and were very cognizant of. Uh, of the struggles that residents often have. And so uh, a lot of times they would uh, kind of check in on on our wellness and make sure that we're doing things to take care of ourselves. But they are still kind of caught in this broken system and kind of have limits on what they could do. Part of it too, and I don't know this for a fact, but this is kind of what I wonder about with medical school training, is you come and uh, by and large, the first two years, you're in a classroom and you're learning about the Krebs cycle, which, you know, very peripherally affects medicine and health, obviously, but not really directly. Mm -hmm. You have all of these, these things that you learn and there's no, it's not obvious why you're learning some of these things. Mm -hmm. And so you get further and further detached from the patient. uh, And then all of a sudden during your third year, you're thrown into patient care rotations, but you've basically been learning basic science, which doesn't necessarily translate to caring for patients. And so you have (laughs) a huge disconnect and, you know, there are schools where they're trying to change that, where they're, they're melding it so that you, um, are having more patient experiences throughout the four years. Um, but I think we're focusing on a lot of the wrong things in, in much of medical education. Honestly, I think if we were taught more personal skills in working with patients, Mm -hmm. but then also uh, more focus on how to find pertinent information quickly, because there's so much medical knowledge, none of us are going to learn it all. And I remember half the stuff I learned in medical school. And A lot of that stuff I don't remember is out of date anyway because of new science and and studies. Uh, And so one of the biggest skills I have to know is how do I find important information quickly? But I don't feel as if I was taught that very well. Hmm. Um, And so, you know, some of these things we just seem to be focusing on on the wrong thing to make us into the nurses and physicians that uh, that we say we want. Hmm. Okay, so in other words, there's some priority shifting that needs to happen here and a change in approach. So, you know, in nursing school, we often go into clinical within in the first semester. Like we're in front of patients when we're completely green and we've only learned maybe how to check a pulse and a blood pressure and do a bed bath. So we're thrown into clinical space pretty darn quickly you know, we've done our prerequisites and our microbio and our AMP and all that stuff. But once we're in nursing school, yeah. we're in the clinical space pretty fast. And it sounds yeah. like in medical school, it often is three years, right? Or 
four years until you're actually touching a patient or talking to a patient. Yeah, usually a, a couple of years. A couple of years. So that, yeah, there's a big difference there. Not to say that nursing education is better than medical education, but I think sure. each each branch of medical nursing training can learn from the other. Like, oh, okay, so maybe a little patient exposure would be good for these first year medical students to see like, oh, how do you do motivational interviewing or yeah. whatever? And and I would think that, you know, is that there's that old trope, old trope, which is probably a cliche, but maybe is true that physicians receive about two hours of nutritional training throughout their years of medical school. That which sounds might, about right, though. It's about right, right. <laughs> so are they teaching about emotional intelligence and behavioral intelligence and relational intelligence in medical school? Are they talking about motivational interviewing? Are they talking, are you really having a course, like a real course on self-care and how to make sure you survive medical school? And I don't mean having a conversation with your attending, you know, over a cup of coffee. I mean, sitting in a classroom and like really learning this stuff and applying this stuff together as a group and as individuals. So it sounds like there's a lot to do. And my hope is that those of you who are now in your 20s and 30s in medical school or residency or new physicians, you've been practicing for a number of years now, but that as you all then become the senior attending physicians and the senior professors in schools of medicine that you you tear up the rule book and rewrite it but the powers that be have to be able to allow you to do that and i think there's yeah we have some hierarchical issues here don't we absolutely and when you look at Things like uh, some changes have tried to be made in in certain uh, residency programs, but the way it's funded, which uh, comes from the federal government, is uh, very restrictive. And so mm -hmm. if you all of a sudden start changing things, your money's cut off. And, uh, hmm. you know, things like that, it's it's like you there are so many people trying to change it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. But so many of us are just limited in what we can actually do. Right. So critical mass is the issue. Yeah. I mentioned that term earlier. So critical mass. And, you know, as we have more of you become the senior attendings and senior professors in medical schools, some of you are also going to become the CEOs and COOs and CMOs of these programs and hospitals and, and schools. So we need a huge sea change and obviously a personnel change. And yes, some people of your generation and younger generations are going to be like the older ones. They're going to kind of have that same mindset. But if we have enough people clamoring for change, perhaps it's going to happen. Yeah. And that's my hope. That's really my hope. And, you know, if people want to find you, I know they go to kylebradfordjones.com yep. and we'll have that in the show notes. You're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We'll have that in the show notes as well. And we'll have a link to the Amazon page for the book for fallible a memoir of a young physician's struggle with mental illness so before we say goodbye and i actually don't want to because there's a lot more to talk <laughs> yeah. about but is there anything we haven't mentioned here today that you feel like is important for us to insert into this conversation really just to emphasize if you are struggling get help mm -hmm. um it's you know it's it's not an ideal system that we work in and it is important for us to work to change it. Uh, but for right now, if it is something where it's it's too much, get the help that you need. Um, absolutely talk about it with somebody because you know, we, we can't afford to lose any more medical personnel and we can't afford to, to provide poor care to our patients. They deserve the best that we can provide. Right, and building upon that, if you're a medical student or a nursing student listening right now, and you're feeling suicidal, there's a hotline, there's national hotlines, there are state hotlines. So we need to make sure that that information is available. I will put that in the show notes so that people can find it. But you can also just Google suicide hotline or anything like that, yeah. and you will find it. Um, I actually really think we need 
Or maybe this exists. You know how you dial 911 for emergency services? I feel like there needs to be a three-digit code on your phone yes. for, say, a suicide hotline. You know, funny you should say that. It actually just passed uh, Congress. It did? Uh, within oh. the last few months. And it's not into effect. It, it takes another year or two to go into effect. And oh. unfortunately, I haven't learned the three-digit number. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Well, <laughs> great minds think alike. Okay, so... In the near future. <laughs> in the very near future, right. And I'll try to put that out there once we have it. So, Kyle, people can get in touch with you. And if they want to order the book, they can, obviously. And do you plan on... I'm putting you on the spot. Do you plan on hitting the lecture circuit and like speaking with medical students and traveling around the country and talking with people? I would love to. I'm I'm hoping to set some things up with that. So that's that's still a work in progress. But yes, I would love to. Well, I think you've done other podcast interviews and I hope you get on Terry Gross, you know, fresh air with Terry <laughs> Gross on NPR, because this needs really like a bigger, bigger stage. I mean, my podcast is relatively small, but mighty. And but I think your message here is huge and I feel like it needs much, much bigger attention. So I know you've written for the Washington Post, the Salt Lake Tribune. Um, I feel like your work needs to be in the New York Times. You know, Teresa Brown is a very famous nurse journalist who writes for the Times on a regular basis for their mm -hmm. well page, I believe. We need people like you out there in public talking about these issues because, you know, doctors aren't God as much as maybe, mm -hmm. you know, they might want to feel like they are, but doctors are as fallible to use the title of your book as anyone else. And yeah. and you have mentioned very clearly that statistically you're even more prone to these issues of mental illness, addiction, substance abuse, etc. So we need to help our physicians because we need them to be able to help us. Right? Yeah. And absolutely. And you know, I agree. People need to to understand that so that we can all support each other and and help each other how we need to. Wow. Well, Kyle, thank you. This has been so amazing. And I wish you the best with the book. I'd like to have you back on the show, maybe later in 2020 or early 2021 to kind of, you know, circle back around and talk about some of this some more. And I'm sure lots of stuff's going to come out from your experiences of of being out in public talking about this. So thank you for your transparency. Thanks for your authenticity and the risks you're taking here, you know, relative risks. And thank you for being a voice of sanity in a world that seems pretty chaotic and difficult right now. So I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you for, for what you've done here. I think it's, it's a real gift to the, to the world. Well, thanks Keith. I appreciate that. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to episode 265 of the Nurse Keith Show. And remember, you want to head to the show notes at nursekeith.com forward slash episode 265 to order the book, Fallible, a memoir of a young physician's struggle with mental illness from Amazon, and to also connect with Kyle if you would like to ask him a question or write him a letter or share your own experiences with him. I hope you feel uplifted and empowered from this episode, and I want you to take inspired action every day in the interest of your personal well-being and your professional satisfaction and happiness. And if you need personalized holistic career coaching, please hit me up at nursekeith.com and we can have a complimentary chat so you can check out coaching and see if it might work for you. And did you know there are job listings and other resources at nursekeith.com? You can find jobs from Reload, Trusted Health, ZipRecruiter, and resources such as OpenMD, a free search engine for evidence-based medicine, a video IV course, and a lot more. So head over to nursekeith.com. The Nurse Keith Show is adroitly produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting, and Mark Capispeason is our stalwart social media ringmaster. I'm grateful to Rob and Mark for keeping the wheels turning in the right direction. Otherwise, I might be going backwards. Anyway, be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Kyle Bradford Jones bidding you adieu from Salt Lake City, Utah. Salt Lake City, Utah. Thank you, Kyle, and we will catch everyone next time.